Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on reproductive health. My name is Holly. I work with the Multicultural Association of Fredericton, and we're happy to have um, some wonderful students from the UNB nursing program who will be doing a presentation on reproductive health. So with that, I will hand it over to them to get started. All right, so hi everyone. We are the UNB nursing students and today we are going to talk about reproductive health. So our group have me, so my name is Ken, and there's Emma Johnston and Megan Morehouse. So this is just an overview of what we're going to go over today. Um, we're going to talk about different contraception methods um, and options. We're going to talk about maternal health. So that includes prenatal care, postnatal care, midwifery. And then we're going to be talking about screening in terms of breast screening and cervical screening. We would just like to start off the presentation by asking you to follow the link on the screen and complete a brief one minute survey. The survey contains two multiple choice questions asking you to rate how, you, how much you feel you already know about women's reproductive health, as well as how comfortable you currently feel accessing reproductive health services. The survey is anonymous and you'll be the only person who knows your answers. At the end of the presentation, you can complete the survey again to see if any of your answers to either of these questions have changed. So first we're going to talk about contraception. So what is contraception? They are also called birth control methods. So simply put, they are used to prevent pregnancy. First, we are going to talk about emergency contraception or morning after pills. These methods are used when someone has unprotected sexual intercourse or forgot to use their birth control method. So the first emergency contraception is plan B. It is available without prescription. These pills are most effective when taken 24 hours after unprotected sexual intercourse, and it can be taken up to five days later. This pill will have a lower effect for people with a body mass index larger than 25. And plan B is located behind the counters in the pharmacy, so you can ask the pharmacy staff to get them for you. And the pharmacist there can also answer any concerns you might have. And on the right hand side, we have another morning after pills, but this one requires a doctor's prescription. It has a higher effect over a longer period of time, and the effects are the same for someone with a higher BMI, so body mass index. So to make it easier to understand, I have ranked the methods from tier one being the most effective to tier three being the least effective methods. So tier one contraception methods are highly effective with less than one out of 100 women get pregnant per year. So first I'm gonna talk about tubal ligation and tubal occlusion. So it is a surgical procedure and it is very effective as birth control methods, but they are very invasive. So this procedure is where the two fallopian tubes gets, um, two fallopian tubes get disconnected. So this is the tube which transport the eggs from the ovaries to the uterus. There are a variety of tubal ligation or tubal occlusion procedure. This procedure can be reversed. However, successful pregnancies are not guaranteed. It depends on other factors, such as how long since the procedure was done and how was the procedure done and the person's own health as well. So this is a hormonal method, intrauterine device. It is a small T-shaped device that is inserted into the uterus by a healthcare provider. It can remain inside the uterus from three to 10 years, depending on the device. It is the most effective form of birth control available with only one to eight out of 100 women getting pregnant while using this method. And the next one is a surgical procedure called vasectomy. 
So this is a procedure to close or block the vas deferens, the tubes that carry sperm to the penis. It is highly effective, but failures do occur. So the pr procedure can be undone through a vasectomy reversal, but the cost for the reversal is very expensive. So you might wanna check with your insurance coverage and healthcare providers before moving forward with this procedure. So the second tier is consists of most of the hormonal contraception. So hormonal contraception regulates the change in hormone level during the woman's cycle, which prevents the ovary from releasing an egg, thickens the cervical mucus and changing the lining of the uterus. So in this tier two methods, only seven out of 100 women get pregnant per year. So the first method is the birth control pill. This is one of the most common methods used in Canada, with more than 1 million women currently using this method as a birth control method. This pill is taken every day, ideally at the same time. And on the right-hand side, we have the contraceptive patch, which is similar to the birth control pills, but in a form of a patch. So it sticks onto the skin and releases hormone into the bloodstream. The patch needs to be replaced once a week, and it can be worn on buttocks, stomach, back, or upper arms, but not on the breast. Another method is the vaginal rings. So this can be inserted and removed by yourself. It can be worn inside for three weeks, followed by a ring-free interval, allowing a period to occur. So the injectable contraception is also commonly known as the double shot. It is a hormone injection given four times a year, so every three months. It is a good choice for a woman who have trouble following a daily, weekly, or monthly routine. And in the tier two um, birth control method, I also include the lactational amenorrhea method. So this method is used by women who have just given birth and are exclusively breastfeeding, meaning you only feed your baby breast milk and the baby has to suck on your breast. So it would not work if you are pumping or if you are bottle feeding your baby. So it is a highly effective method with the rate of up to 98%, or in other terms, it is as effective as the birth control pills if all the guidelines are followed. So this method is effective for the first six months after childbirth, provided that the woman breastfeed at least every four hours during the day and every six hours through the night, and her menstrual period has not yet returned. So this method will no longer be effective when your baby is older than six months or your period has returned or if you are pumping or bottle feeding your baby. So next, I'm going to talk about the tier three. Um, so this is one of the least effective um, methods. So the non-hormonal contraception, they act as a physical barrier preventing the contact between the sperm and the vagina. So in this tier, more than 13 out of 100 women get pregnant per year. So they are not very effective. So first I'm gonna talk about the male condom, which is worn over the penis during sexual intercourse or oral sex. This method is also effective in preventing sexually transmitted infections. Condoms should be put on before any skin-to-skin -skin contact occurs. The picture on the right shows the female condom, which is a soft, loose-fitting, seamless sheath contain containing two flexible rings, one at each end. It can be inserted into the vagina before sex and can be, re can be placed in the vagina up to eight hours before sexual intercourse. So it is important to note that a new condom must be used for each repeated act of sexual intercourse. So this is a less common method, 
So the contraceptive sponge, it is a small disposable foam device that's placed inside the vagina and contains spermicide to absorb and trap sperm. So this is this method is less effective for women who have given birth. And as of today, there is only one brand of contraceptive sponge available, and it can be purchased over the counter at the local pharmacies. Spermicide is a chemical that destroys sperm on contact. It should be used along with another method of contraception and applied again for each act of repeated sexual intercourse. It is the least effective contraceptive method. And now I'm going to move into the natural um, contracep contraception methods. So this includes fertility awareness method meaning getting used to your menstrual cycle and fertile window. So ovulation is the time where the woman's menstrual cycle, sorry, so ovulation is the time during the woman's menstrual cycle when she is most likely to be pregnant. So conception occur when sexual intercourse takes place during the fertile window. So five days before to one day after ovulation. So how can you become familiar with your menstrual cycle? There are a lot of methods, including measuring your basal body temperature every day and put it on a special form. Check your urine with ovulation kit. Um, observing change in the cervical mucus, using an app to follow calendar methods and track your menstrual cycle and ovulation or a combination of these methods. So the next method in this category is withdrawal methods, or also called the pull-out method. It is an attempt to avoid any sperm ejaculated into the vagina or on the vulva during sexual intercourse. For this method to work, both partners have to be really careful because before ejaculation, there is some fluid released from the penis that contains sperm. So it is important to note that this is a very risky method. Unplanned pregnancy do occurs in one out of five users. And the last method is abstinence, so not having sexual intercourse. In other terms, avoiding vaginal intercourse. Avoid any contact between the penis and vagina. And theoretically, this method is 100% effective. So if you are pregnant, what to do next? So first, contact your healthcare provider immediately. There are a lot of options for you to choose from, and they will go over it with you to find the best options that fits you. And if the pregnancy is unwanted, you can also discuss your options with your healthcare providers. And we also have pamphlets that are that kind of summarize the contraception options and access, and it includes the more common methods. And it's kind of blurry on the presentation here, but if you are interested, um, we can provide, it, provide you with the pamphlets. And that concludes my part for the contraception method, and we're gonna move into prenatal care. So now we're gonna move into what prenatal prenatal care is. Prenatal care is the care a pregnant woman receives that supports her healthy pregnancy, prevents and identifies health concerns with the mom or with the baby, and it provides an opportunity to ask questions. It's recommended that you have a primary caregiver that you trust when you're pregnant. There is a lot of information to know when you're pregnant about being healthy um, and just generally. So having someone that you can trust, someone that you can reach out to is a really good option. You can also get in contact with your healthcare provider um, with preconception planning. So if you're not pregnant, but you're interested in becoming pregnant, um, you can have a meeting with them to talk about how you can do that. When you are pregnant, you will have routine checkups. So for every four weeks up until 28 weeks, every two weeks from 29 to 36, and then up until delivery, you'll have an appointment every single week. During these appointments, your healthcare provider will check your baseline. So they will check your blood pressure, 
your blood glucose, all those things um, in order to make sure um, that you're on the right track. They will identify changes um, in your baseline to see how you're progressing in the pregnancy. And they will also check and record the fetal growth of the baby um, and their overall health. When you're pregnant, um, being screened for gestational diabetes is recommended. Um, gestational diabetes is on the rise globally. It's when a woman has diabetes during pregnancy um, and she does not necessarily have to have uh, diabetes before she gets pregnant. Um, it is an elevated level of blood glucose within, with the, an inability to produce enough insulin and it can cause complications to the pregnancy, such as increased baby growth, which could lead to an increased need for a C-section or further complications. Personal hygiene is a big thing to take into effect when you're pregnant. Um, when you're pregnant, there's an increased production of sweat due to the hormones that your body is releasing. So increasing um, the amount of times that you're washing or bathing, um, having a bath is okay, but just be aware that as your pregnancy progresses, your center of gravity will shift, and so you're more likely to trip and slip, um, so just being cautious of that. When you're pregnant, it's a good idea to avoid hot tubs and saunas and tanning beds, as that could um, be a place where there's an increased ability to acquire different bacteria, and it can also raise the temperature of the baby. There is also an increased risk of bacterial dental plaque due to hormones. So making sure that you are flossing and brushing your teeth really well to avoid that bacterial buildup. Exercise is another thing to take into good consideration when you're pregnant because it's essential to reduce some risks. It promotes circulation in your body. It reduces constipation, bloating, and swelling. It builds strength to better cope with labor. It improves posture and back muscles. It promotes sleep and relaxation. And it also helps you if you build those habits during pregnancy, then getting back to um, your normal self after pregnancy to build that strength after you have given birth. Um, some of the examples of good exercise that women can have could be brisk walking or swimming or biking, um, working out three or four times consistently and as your pregnancy progresses, um, making those exercises may be less intense, but still getting out and doing some walking. Um, make sure that you have good shoe comfort and support and avoid getting overheated. So just going for a walk would be great, um, but no contact sports. So now we move into postnatal care. Postnatal care is the care that a woman receives after she's had a baby. So these are just some tips that um, they teach in the hospital to reduce your pain after you've had a baby. So applying ice to reduce perineal comfort. Um, a lot of times in the hospital, they will take pads that women wear and they will put water on them and freeze them in the freezer so that you can wear them and they can reduce that pain and that discomfort using a peri bottle while peeing. So that is that bottle that you see on the screen there. Filling that with warm water um, will reduce that discomfort when peeing. Using a salt bath or a sitz bath will reduce swelling. So a sitz bath is that other picture that you see um, in on the slide there. It's just um, hot water where there's salt in it to reduce swelling and promote that healing. There's also a recommended refrain from sexual activity for six weeks to allow for healing. Midwifery is also something that is new and common in New Brunswick. And so we're just gonna talk a little bit about that option. So a registered midwife provide ongoing care to women and babies during pregnancy, birth, and in the postpartum period. You do not need a referral from a doctor for a midwife. Um, sometimes the doctor will be involved in helping you make the decision of what is best um, and what you would like to have for your baby, but you can call the midwife as soon as you're pregnant and try to get in and make an appointment with them. These are just some of the values of midwifery. So midwifery, they value informed choice. So educating you on all of your options to allow you to make the decisions that are best for you and your baby. They value partnership. So they very much work with you um, to have the birth of your choice. Evidence-based care. Midwives are very professional regulated health professionals um, and everything that they do is based on evidence. 
and choice of birthplace. So you can decide if you want to have your baby in the hospital or at home or in a clinic or wherever you decide they will work with you to decide what's best for you. This is a map from the Midwife of Canada website. And so this is just an overview of all the different midwives in each province across Canada and how many midwife led births there are in each province. If you look down at the bottom in New Brunswick, we have seven midwives here in New Brunswick and we have five midwife students that are training to become midwives. And this map is from 2019. So in 2019, we had 42 midwife led births. So midwifery in New Brunswick, it was regulated in 2016. So it's still fairly new, still getting established. But this is a picture of the midwifery center here in Fredericton. It's on the north side of Fredericton. Um, and there's some contact information there if you're interested, email, um, phone number. And if you are pregnant, you are more than welcome to call that number um, and try to get in an appointment with them. So now we'll be moving on to talking about breast cancer, what it is, and how you can best protect yourself through early detection. Firstly, we are going to go over the basic anatomy of the breast. The breasts are accessory organs for a female's reproductive system. The breasts are made up of fat, connective tissues, glands, and ducts. Women and men both have breasts. However, women have more breast tissue than men. The breast can be divided by an imaginary line into four quadrants, running up and down and right and left through the nipple. Now we'll be, we will be going over going into an explanation of what breast cancer is. Breast cancer is a disease that starts in the cells of the breast tissue. In some cases, change to the cells of the breast can lead to the development of breast cancer. A cancerous, also known as a malignant tumor, is a group of cancerous cells that can grow and destroy nearby tissues. These cancerous cells can also spread to other parts of the body. In New Brunswick, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women and is one of the leading causes of cancer-related deaths. Fortunately, these death rates can be decreased through earlier screening, diagnosis, increased awareness, and improvements to cancer treatment. Breast cancer can range in severity depending on the time of diagnosis. Staging is used to describe or classify a cancer based on how much cancer there is in the body and where the cancer is present at the time of diagnosis. Information collected from tests are used to find, the, to find out the size of the tumor, where the cancer is present in the breast, if the cancer has spread to other parts of the body, and where the cancer has spread to. Staging for cancer is arranged from stage zero to stage four, depending on how severe the spread of the cancer is. There are some biological and lifestyle factors that can increase a person's risk for developing breast cancer. Some of these factors are non-modifiable, meaning you cannot change them, and some are modifiable, meaning they can be changed. Some of the non-modifiable risk factors include your genetics or having a family history of breast cancer, being a woman, increasing in age, having a history of benign or non-cancerous breast disease, having a menstrual cycle at an early age, and experiencing menopause later than the average age range. Some of the modifiable risk factors include obesity or being overweight, not getting enough physical activity, having an alcohol intake of more than one drink per day, smoking, and being on hormone therapy. It's important to know that these risk factors do not determine whether or not a person will develop breast cancer, but they do increase the risk for breast cancer developing. There are some common signs a woman can look for when detecting breast cancer. Firstly, the breast can be felt for any lumps or masses. Typically, the lumps are painless, hard lumps that do not move. Most commonly, lumps will present near the armpit, but can occur in any area of the breast. You can also look for any changes to the shape or size of your breast, as well as any changes to the nipples themselves. This usually presents as the nipple becoming pointed inward or inverted. You may also look for any discharge or blood that comes out of the nipple without squeezing as another potential warning sign. As breast cancer begins to spread to other areas of the body, the signs and symptoms may begin to present differently or in addition to the earlier signs and symptoms. A few of these signs and symptoms include bone pain, weight loss, nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite, jaundice or yellowing of the skin, shortness of breath, seeing double vision and muscle weakness. 
Breast self exams are the best way to monitor for the signs and symptoms mentioned on the previous slides. Breast self exams can be completed in three steps, starting with looking at your breasts in the mirror with your arms by your sides and then again with your arms raised. You should be looking for any dimpling, puckering, redness, changes to the nipple, or any discharge leaking from the nipple if you are not breastfeeding. The next step is to feel your breast while lying down. Use the opposite hand to examine each breast with your two fingertip pads using small circular motions and covering the entire surface area of the breast. The third step is to feel your breast while standing up. This is easiest done in the shower or during any hygiene care, especially with soap over the area to make lumps and tissue easier to feel. Now we'll move on to talking about breast screening and what the process of being screened for breast cancer looks like. The purpose of breast screening is to detect breast cancer as soon as possible. Detecting breast cancer as soon as possible can help reduce the risk of mortality and death. Breast screening can be accessed through your doctor, primary health care provider, or public health clinics. Breast self exams should still be completed regularly with hygiene care, even if a breast screening appointment has been made. The New Brunswick Breast Cancer Screening Program is a population-based provincial screening program with the purpose of detecting cancers of the breast as soon as possible. This program encourages average risk asymptomatic women between the ages of 50 and 74 to participate in routine screening, screening mammography at one of the screening mammography sites across the province. The routine screening for this age group should be completed every two to three years, as long as the previous mammography results come back as normal and your healthcare provider does not voice any concerns. As discussed in the previous slide, women between the ages of 50 and 74 with no signs, symptoms, or family history of breast cancer should be screened every two to three years. Women who do not fall into this age range but all, and also have no signs, symptoms, or previous diagnosis of breast cancer can still be accepted for screening mammography by referral from a primary health care provider. Typically, routine screening is not recommended for women uh, under the age of 40 unless they are experiencing signs, signs or symptoms or have a family history of breast cancer. If you are unsure about your family history of breast cancer, it is better to be safe than sorry you still have the right to ask for a screening referral from your primary health care provider. This slide outlines what a mammography is. A mammography is an x-ray of the breast that uses low doses of radiation. The x-ray picture made during this progress, sorry, process is called a mammogram. This picture can help a healthcare professional find both cancerous or malignant or non-cancerous or benign tumors that may exist in the breast. There are two types of mammography that serve two different purposes. A, a screening mammography is used for women who do not have any signs and symptoms of breast cancer or breast prob problems. This can help discover lumps or any abnormal areas of the breast tissue that may be too small or difficult to be felt by hand. This screening can help find cancer at an early stage. After a screening mammography, um, you may be referred for a diagnostic mammography, which is used to diagnose a breast problem, such as a lump or suspicious area that has been found through the screening process. Sometimes the screening, screening mammography may be skipped if you or your health provider have already noticed a problem within the breast. The diagnostic mammography is more thorough and takes a longer amount of time to complete. This slide provides an overview of what to expect when receiving a mammography. There are typically, these are typically completed in clinics or hospital x-ray departments. The woman's breast will be placed between two plastic compression plates. The plates are then pressed together in order to flatten or compress the breast. This process can look kind of scary, but if you have any discomfort during the x-ray, you can tell the radiation technologist who is during, doing the test. They may be able to adjust the compression to make it more comfortable for you. If the results from a screening, screening mammography are abnormal, the healthcare provider will decide if further tests are needed or not. After the diagnostic mammography, the healthcare provider may also refer you to a breast ultrasound, a biopsy, or an MRI. If a cancer diagnosis is made, all potential treatment options will be outlined for you in which you have the right to decide which action to take. In regards to treatment, it's important to recognize the earliest it's important to recognize that the earliest detection helps lead to the best possible outcome and best chance of recovery. 
We just want to briefly touch on cervical cancer and screening as another health seminar was presented earlier this week regarding this topic. Cervical cancer is a disease that causes cells to grow abnormally or out of control within the cervix. Cervical cancer is a preventable disease, meaning that these abnormal cells um, can be found early uh, and treated early so that cervical cancer can be stopped before it is able to develop. Just like breast cancer, screening for early detection is the best treatment um, for cervical cancer. This is done by what is known as a PAC test, which can also be accessed through primary healthcare providers or health clinics. Now I will provide some detail on the resources we have available for breast and cervical screenings. So here in Fragton, the main screening resource is available um, in both Fragton and the surrounding areas um, that I want to highlight include the Fragton Downtown Community Health Center, um, as it is located in the center of downtown Fragton and offers a variety of reproductive health services. Um, there's also the Gibson Health Center, um, which is another clinic located on the north side of Fragton. This clinic offers a wide range of reproductive health services as well. Um, the UMB Student Health Center located on the University of New Brunswick campus is a great resource for students attending either UMB or St. Thomas universities. All of the resources on the screen can be accessed either online through their individual websites or by calling, or by calling, um, sorry, all of the resources on the screen can be accessed either online through their individual websites or by calling the numbers listed on the screen to schedule an appointment. It is important to acknowledge that services accessed uh, will remain confidential between you and the healthcare provider. Sorry, that was a phone call. Um, if an abnormal finding is discovered through screening, diagnostic services can be accessed at the Dr. Everett Chalmers Regional Hospital located at 700 Priestman Street in Franklin. Referrals to diagnostic services will be made by the healthcare provider who examined the results from the screening process. Again, if a diagnosis is made, you'll be informed on the risk and benefits of all treatment options and allowed to make an informed decision for yourself on the next steps to take. And this concludes our presentation on women's reproductive health. If desired, you can now retake the survey from the beginning of the presentation to see if your answers have changed um, throughout the information you gained. And uh, please feel free to ask any remaining questions you have regarding the three main topics we covered today, and we'll be happy to answer them.